And I couldn't believe it. It just didn't seem like it was possible that that was the way people were tried and convicted in the United States. It was kind of an exciting place to be in the late 60s. There was a lot of marijuana importing. He had never had any violence in his life. He didn't have priors or anything. During the 30-day trial, I'd probably lost 20 pounds. It's very stressful. They had kept John in isolation for a year before the trial. There was a board over the window. They kept his calorie count down. They kept the heat low. They woke him every hour. They made it very difficult for anybody to visit. You have 15 minutes of a phone call, and you have to be there to pass it around. And you kind of get a little angry about the criminal justice system because it's taken away a very important person in everybody's life. Can you see that? My mother's memorial after she died. It's horrible not to have him there. He's the only one missing. This is his son's graduation from college. As a child, I didn't understand why, why he got taken away from us, why he had to leave. My dad's a minister's son. He grew up in a small town in Indiana. He's kind, he's caring, he's funny. And somehow, over all of these years, he's maintained his sense of humor. He's just a decent man. And that's what makes most of this so hard. I live in Washington now, where, from where I'm sitting, uh, I could walk about three blocks and buy marijuana. We're minting the next batch of, of millionaires and billionaires in this country, in this industry. And yet my father's still in prison. It just doesn't compute. Clemency Project 2014 invited nonviolent drug offenders to file petitions for clemency. America is a nation of second chances, and I believe these folks deserve their second chance. I thought, well, I have to find out if other people have a sentence like that. I couldn't, I, I couldn't believe it. It's a very hit and miss kind of process. There's no real formula for what you put in. It is a system that is pretty much designed not to produce grants of clemency. But the first step is someone in the office of the pardon attorney, a staff member, will review the petition. And one of the things that they're directed to do is to reach out to the local prosecutor who brought the case in the first place and get their opinion. These are the people that chose to seek that sentence in the first place. It's pretty rare that they're going to say, oh yeah, we were wrong, that was too much. Once that review is done, they pass the file along to the pardon attorney herself. Now the pardon attorney's office, what I've just described, they're in DOJ, the building of prosecutors that you know sought the sentences in the first place. The next step is going to be at the office of the deputy attorney general. First, it goes to a staff member in that office. And then the fourth step is to the deputy attorney general, him or herself. The DAG is, has a ton of responsibilities, but significantly, they're also the direct supervisor of those local attorneys. And they don't want to be reversing their decisions basically through clemency. So there's a strong bias against doing that. The other thing about the DAG is that the DAG is a generalist, has a ton of other things on his or her desk. I mean, look at Rod Rosenstein, for example, and everything that he had to deal with. Do you really think clemency petitions were taking much of a priority? No. 
Now, from that point, it finally leaves the DOJ. It goes to a staff member at the White House Counsel's Office. They take a look. They pass it along to the White House Counsel. And then finally, it goes to the president, who's going to be the decider, if it ever gets to that level. The list came down. I saw it was a denial list. And the attorney just kept saying, oh, don't look, don't look, don't look. When the, the final round came through and his name wasn't on it, I was on the bus coming back from work and just frantically scrolling through the list of names and getting to the point in the alphabet in the K's where he should be and not finding him. It was the most devastating feeling. Uh, it felt like you couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe for six months, I think. But the hardest part was all of the people that I'd advocated for who had been denied also. It, it was over. And you had to like start out lobbying again for the process to start, for somebody to care. Obama wanted to grant clemency petitions, and they did. About 1,700 petitions were granted for commutations. And that was great, but there were so many that didn't make it through and so many more deserving people that should have gotten it. You look at Alice Johnson, for example, who was finally granted by President Trump. She was denied three times, and it was a great case. So even when they try to crank this machine hard, it's still broken. Obama had faith in the system. He had faith in the administrative process. He followed the, their recommendations. I think the biggest thing is to pull the process out of DOJ and put it in the hands of a bipartisan board that would make recommendations directly to the president. And that's what you see in the states. This is something that is not a red-blue uh, divide. People who are libertarian, people who are conservative, people who are progressive really believe that these laws are wrong that clemency should be granted. If you're involved in a campaign or if you support a candidate, push them to take a position on clemency, specifically on marijuana. If you go to a candidate event, ask the question, would you use clemency to free marijuana prisoners? Describe John Knox's story. 